The chairman of the G20 summit meetings says a walkout staged by officials from the United States, Britain and Canada over Russia's participation in a meeting of finance officials from the world's 20 biggest economies did not derail the meeting's focus on finding common ground to address headwinds confronting global growth. The top finance officials walked out of the G20 meeting as Russian representatives spoke, exposing deepening divisions over Russia's continued presence uh, in the body. Ukrainian officials in Washington, seeking billions of dollars of additional funding, also worked out of the meeting. Uh, Indonesian Finance Minister Sri Mulyani Indrawati, who chaired the gathering in Washington, said the walkout during the group of 20 finance ministers and central bankers meeting was, quote, not a total surprise and was not disruptive to the group's wider discussion. The G20 includes Western countries that have accused Moscow of war crimes in Ukraine, as well as China, India, Indonesia and South Africa, which have not joined Western-led sanctions against Russia over the conflict. All members see the G20 is a very important forum, a premier economic cooperation forum for us to discuss both in terms of the risk as well as how we should coordinate and collaborate together. I think that is something which is really very very strongly expressed uh, uh, during the meeting. So I'm confident that this will not erode the uh, uh, cooperation as well as uh, the role of the G20 Forum. Well, this is an extraordinary situation. It's not uh, business as usual, a very dynamic and challenging one. So for Indonesia, since, host, uh, since we hosted uh, the first finance minister and central bank governor meeting back in February in Jakarta, the development of the global environment is actually deteriorated and changed very fast due to the first pandemic, which is not yet over. The second one is the Russia war uh, in Ukraine. Members express deep concerns about humanitarian crisis, economic and financial impact of the war, and called for the end of the war as soon as possible. Many members condemned the war as unprovoked and unjustifiable and a violation of international law. Members share the view that the war and the associated action have and will continue to hinder the global economic recovery process, raising particular concern about food security and energy prices. And United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres has separately asked Russian President Vladimir Putin and Ukrainian leader Vladimir Zelensky to receive him to discuss steps to bring about peace following Moscow's invasion of its neighbor. Spokesman Stefan Jujaric said separate letters were handed to the permanent missions of Russia and Ukraine days ago, asking their leaders to receive Mr. Guterres in Moscow as well as in Kiev. Mr. Gutierrez had earlier called for a four-day Orthodox Easter humanitarian pause in fighting in Ukraine to allow for the safe passage of civilians to leave areas of conflict and the delivery of humanitarian aid to hard-hit areas. Meanwhile, a military spokesperson for General Staff of the Armed Forces, Alexander Shutupin, says one tank, 10 armored units and two vehicles, one artillery system, two special engineering units, an anti-aircraft missile system and an enemy ammunition depot have been destroyed in the past 24 hours. In the east, Ukraine said it had held off an assault by Russian forces attempting to advance in what Kiev called the Battle of the Donbass, a new campaign to seize two eastern provinces, Moscow claims, on behalf of separatists. Russia's defense ministry said its forces had carried out strikes on dozens of military facilities in the east and had shot down a Ukrainian MI-8 helicopter near the village of Korovyevya.
In a presidential address, Ukrainian leader Vladimir Zelensky said the situation in the east and south of the country remains extremely harsh. He added that Russia's new attack, focusing on certain areas in the country, was an effort to snatch at least some kind of victory, at least something that they could feed to their propaganda peddlers. Uh, earlier in the week, the UK and Defence Ministry spokesperson uh, had said Russian forces were attacking along the entire front line in eastern Ukraine, pressing their siege of Mariupol in the south and trying to encircle cities in the regions of Donetsk and Luhansk. In his address, Mr. Zelensky said he and Ukrainian diplomats were working 24-7 to secure supplies of arms and speed up the arrival of military aid. Ukrainian officials have repeatedly said Moscow wants to seize the southeastern city of Mariupol and all the territory that Ukrainian government forces still hold in Luhansk and Donetsk to create a land link with Crimea, which Russia seized and annexed in 2014. We are going to see far worse, that's U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken warned as Ukraine seeks humanitarian corridors from Mariupol to evacuate citizens in the city. Ukrainian officials estimated that about a thousand civilians were sheltering underneath the vast Azovstal steel plant, which is the last Ukrainian stronghold in the city of Mariupol. Moscow's invasion of Ukraine, the biggest attack on a uh, Western uh, European state since 1945 is uh, reported to have killed several thousands and more than uh, 12 million now need humanitarian aid. And that's according to the United Nations. Since starting what it called the efforts to demilitarize uh, Ukraine, Russia has bombed cities to rubble and hundreds of civilian bodies have been found its, in towns after its bodies withdrew. And U.S. President Joe Biden says that he did not think Russian President Vladimir Putin expected to face a unified NATO when he launched uh, the invasion of Ukraine. His comments come as Ukraine proposed talks with Moscow over evacuating troops and civilians from Mariupol after a Russian surrender or die ultimatum expired yesterday, leaving many trapped at a steel plant, the last stronghold of a resistance. A few a dozen civilians managed to leave the strategically important southeastern port in a small bus convoy, uh, escaping the fiercest battle of uh, the nearly nine-week war. Let's talk to Dr. Joshua Orabi. He's a lecturer uh, in uh, Moscow. He's also a member uh, of the uh, Church Foundation in Azad. Uh, Dr. Orabi, good morning. Thank you for your time. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Good morning to you. The situation, uh, of course, in Russia is radically different from that in uh, Ukraine. Uh, things are a lot more peaceful, shall we say, in Russia. But then it, it has been the recipient of a lot of uh, people fleeing what is going on in Ukraine. And this has included uh, Nigerians. What can you tell us about uh, what has been possible uh, so far since this started some uh, almost nine weeks now? ago okay um well so far just like you said um in the russian terrain we have had peace relatively um there's been no challenge no problems whatsoever yes of course emotionally um uh, things are not as stable especially that we receive calls from home uh, and uh, this on its own um, causes already to us, to us panic. Um, the Russian environment and uh, the news, the media has not really shown to us that there's any uh, challenge. The only problems that we may see uh, are those that happen right now on the Ukrainian ground because we also uh, see the news just like the whole world does. And we're really worried. We're, um, we're standing in solidarity with the people of Ukraine uh, and uh, with our people, uh, with Nigerians and Africans who, who were trapped and most of uh, which are already out of the country. And uh, I believe we all already know that the Russians and the Ukrainians are one family, joined by marriage, by blood. They are the same people. Uh, 
during my own days as a student, I visited Ukraine severally. My wife studied in Ukraine. She studied medicine. She's a medical doctor. Um, so it's the same people, the same Russian language. I speak in Russia. It's the same Russian language I speak in Ukraine. Um, so we understand that definitely there must have been an interference for this, uh, I call it family situation to have happened. So far. You, 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 of course, reference the fact that um, uh, your wife studied medicine in Ukraine itself. And there are presently a lot of uh, Nigerian students uh, who were studying mainly medicine uh, uh, in Ukraine. And a lot of them had to flee. Uh, we had spoken to one of the executives uh, of the Nigerians in Diaspora organization uh, who referenced that uh, a number of universities and other uh, institutions in Russia had offered uh, to give some space uh, to some of the Nigerian students who were displaced uh, by the fighting uh, in Ukraine and that um, uh, NIDO was playing a, a significant role in that. What can you tell us about that as well as uh, the efforts of the organization to provide uh, some sort of uh, humanitarian aid to those who are leaving? Well, concerning humanitarian aid, uh, I should once again uh, give kudos to Nigerians in the Diaspora Europe, uh, Organization Europe, uh, headed by uh, uh, Dr. Obashikola, who is actually from the Russian chapter. Uh, that organization, day and night, uh, had been on their toes, uh, believe me, in Poland, in Hungary, in uh, Slovakia, in uh, Romania, all our chapter heads and executives have been working day and night. I am on the page of, uh, of, of um, uh, uh, on a platform where we still discuss this matters daily, even till date, till this moment before I joined the interview. And um, it's been a hold of work on the neck of the Nigerians in Europe. And I must really salute the courage so far. And of course, the diplomatic missions have done a great job. So uh, creating humanitarian support, humanitarian assistance. Uh, um, some Nigerians are still trapped uh, in Europe. I believe none is in, in Ukraine at the moment. I want to believe so, except for those who have decided to stay back or those who have become citizens of Ukraine um, due to the, the policy that everyone who is, every man, man now, who is within the ages of 18 to 60 must stay back to fight. Well, if we had such Nigerians in such categories, then yet. Yeah. But aside that, everyone else is being given the opportunity to flee, to escape, and uh, Naido is, is really doing a great job feeding, putting them to... Um, to jobs, to getting one or two things to be done, trying to get them into universities. Now, coming to the Russian end, I particularly gave a call uh, from my own uh, office to the Ministry of Education of the Russian Federation, confirming that the ministry actually is made available an opportunity for every single foreigner who has escaped from Ukraine to get into the Russian educational system. I am in the academia myself as a lecturer, and I know definitely that the Ministry of Education, the Russian Ministry of Education, has since been very kind and generous with training of foreigners. Most of uh, the Russian trained uh, Nigerians and Africans and even foreigners, most of them have been on the free Russian education for ages. Until now, I also had the opportunity, first I came to study free, I mean, fee paying, but then later I got uh, an opportunity to study on scholarship um, due to my um, activities, my social activities, then as a student. And so this same time, the Ministry of Education is giving an opportunity to every single Nigerian, every foreigner who was studying in the uh, Ukraine, and now as an opportunity to come over here to study. How do they do this? They go to the Russian houses. There is a Russian house in each country, but in cases where there are no Russian houses, they go to the, to the embassy, the Russian embassy in that country, and file an application. So such students enters already from September on the federal scholarship, the Russian government scholarship, rather, and then um, enters into the year one, the first year, 
this as this was how it was explained the first year and then um providing after providing documents to show that he or she has been studying for example in the third year in the fourth year the fifth year the sixth year the the school the university that has has uh, absorbed such students will take the students to his rightful place of study so making sure that no one actually loses out on the education and this the the the, the russian federation is also giving this uh, as an act of his kindness to um uh, to absorb people free of charge to study and i know of course also under this program that they still receive some very menial very little little stipends which also can sustain them in paying for uh for accommodation within the school territory and buying some few things in the course of the month this is good and i don't think anyone else so far has been able to do, to do this the other question i wanted to raise with you has to do with day-to-day -day living um all we, we, as you said earlier in the interview, uh, we all read the news, all this, uh, the sanctions that have been imposed on Russia, mainly economic. Uh, uh, with people out there who, you know, are living day to day, uh, like you pointed out, you're a lecturer, uh, if you're living day to day and so on, do you really get to feel the impact of these sanctions? For example, uh, do you have international ATM cards that have stopped working since all of this began? Well, so far, it's not been as harsh as the, the world think it is. Um, it's, not in, it's not possible not to feel the heat one way or the other, especially from the banking systems. Um, our banks informed us that we may not be able to use our visa cards outside Russia. But within Russia, we still use them. We already have other Russian cards too, like the MIR. We use it easily. We have no challenges. Yes, at the beginning of the sanctions, food was almost going scarce because people feared that there may be less supplies. So uh, we had people who went to the shops to hoard food. And for this reason, um, we had limited supply. But then after a while, everyone saw that it was not going to be as bad. So people went back to their usual lives. Things, uh, the cost of um, food got a bit expensive, and I believe this is global. Like everyone else is complained about um, about the cost of food, and um, it's everywhere. But in the Russian Federation itself, we've not experienced such a massive, um, such uh, grievous um, uh, uh, situations, such that may be threatening to living or to life. No, no. Everything is going on as smooth as possible. I am in Moscow, and life is as usual as it used to be. In fact, this time more than ever, the Russian government is understood that it is necessary to give more information, more support, encouragement to its citizens. Uh, and this is happening right now. So it's even getting, there is a glimpse of hope that things will even get better than it used to be, so to say, at the current instance. Indeed. Uh, Dr. Uh, Joshua Orabi, I want to thank you uh, for your work uh, in NIDO and other such organizations uh, for Nigerians and others uh, who have found themselves in harm's way with uh, this conflict. Uh, and to wish you the very best. Uh, stay safe uh, as this uh, situation unfolds. Thank you very much for your time this morning. Thank you so much. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin welcomed his Polish counterpart, Marius Blazes, to the Pentagon, where he thanked Poland for its ongoing military and humanitarian support to Ukraine. Russia's invasion had triggered a massive displacement of people in the nearly nine weeks since it began, including more than seven million Ukrainians within the country. UN data showed that uh, 5.03 million people had fled Ukraine as at April the 20th. Uh, more than half of them have entered the European Union through Poland, where many had family and other connections uh, living in the region's largest pre-war uh, Ukrainian community. I'm reminded once again of the old Polish saying, for our freedom and for yours. Mr. Minister, Poland has once again demonstrated that spirit in the past two months since the invasion. You have helped the Ukrainian people fight for their country and escape from the horrors of war. You have provided much needed security assistance to the Ukrainian military, 
to help it continue to successfully fight back invading Russian forces. And you have performed the absolutely essential role of facilitating the delivery of security assistance from the United States and other NATO allies and partners from around the globe. Perhaps most importantly, the Polish people have opened their hearts and their homes to millions of Ukrainians fleeing the violence. And you've done it with grace and honor. So, Mr. Minister, please accept my sincerest thanks for what you and your country are doing to assist Ukraine in defending its freedom and the freedom of Europe. I look forward to discussing the ways in which we can further strengthen our close partnership in this and other important areas. I appreciate this uh, cooperation, especially nowadays, when we experience Russian invasion and atrocities in Ukraine. Uh, this uh, unjustified and uh, unprovoked war is a Russian attempt to shake and fracture the foundations of Europe Atlantic order and it provides us with major challenges to the Polish, European, and Allied security. With great concern, we are observing everyday Russian attacks in Ukraine. I trust that Russia will be held accountable for all its war crimes, especially acts of genocide against the civilian population. I am grateful for the U.S. engagement and commitment in solidifying Allied posture against this war. Strengthening of NATO's eastern flank, including deployment of additional troops to Poland and support for, uh, for NATO response forces, is a proof of the U.S. reliability and uh, steadfast assurance of the American dedication to safety of NATO's European partners. I believe that the U.S. active defense policy and leadership is crucial in preventing the Kremlin from any hostile acts against NATO members. A senior uh, Moscow diplomat has said the war in Ukraine, which Russia calls a special military operation, will end when NATO countries uh, stop threatening Russia by using Ukraine for their own uh, purposes. Alexei Polishuk, director of the Second Department for Commonwealth of Independent States Affairs in the Russia's uh, Foreign Ministry, told state news agency TASS that the special military operation will end when its tasks are completed, and these include the protection of the civilian population of Donbass, the demilitarization and denazification of Ukraine, as well as the elimination of threats to Russia emanating from Ukrainian territory due to its being captured uh, by NATO countries. And Chinese President Xi Jinping has uh, reiterated China's opposition to unilateral sanctions and what is called a long-arm jurisdiction. In a video speech to the annual Boa Forum for Asia gathering on the southern uh, Chinese island of Hainan, Mr. Yi proposed a global security initiative which would, among other things, reject Cold War mentality, oppose unilateralism and say no to group politics and block confrontation. China has repeatedly criticized Western sanctions, including those against Russia over its invasion of Ukraine, but has been careful not to provide assistance to Moscow that could lead to sanctions being imposed on Beijing. And in Europe, its Council President Charles Michel's visit to President Vladimir Zelensky was a surprising one, intended to show solidarity with Ukraine during the Russian invasion. Michel's trip followed visits this month to Kiev by European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen, European Union Foreign Policy Chief Joseph Borrell, and European Parliament President Roberta Metzola. Michel, the head of the European Council that represents the Union's 27 member states, describes the damage he saw during his visit to Borodyanka, northwest of the Ukrainian capital Kiev, as atrocious. Today, we have decided 1.5 billion euros in military equipment, and day after day, in close consultation with you, we are trying to convince member states to add bilateral support in order to make sure that what we provide is what you need, and we discuss very precisely what are the needs and how we are able to make sure that we can provide with the EU member states and other partners the means that are needed in order to fight and in order to win this war. 
there are no words in order to explain what I feel, not as president of the European Council, but as, as father, as human being. These are atrocities. These are war crimes. It must be punished. It will be punished. They must pay for what they have done there in, and in many other cities and other locations in Ukraine. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky has discussed sanctions against Russia and aid for Ukraine during Michel's visit to Kiev. He urged Brussels to strengthen sanctions, pressure on Russia, and called for a full energy embargo, including oil and gas exports. He welcomes the sixth package of sanctions being prepared by the EU but added that oil should definitely be a part of that package. Uh, we think that without it, the package would not be powerful, it would be empty. Mr. Zelensky said an estimated 1,000 civilians were sheltering at the Azovstal steel plant, the last remaining outpost of Ukrainian forces in Mariupol. Uh, the president said he remained ready to swap Russian prisoners of war in exchange for safe passage for trapped Ukrainian civilians and soldiers. And German Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock says Germany will stop importing oil from Russia by the end of this year. She said this after a meeting with her Baltic counterparts. Her Latvian counterparts said Europe must further reduce its trade with Russia following the invasion of Ukraine, including energy imports. Lithuanian Foreign Minister Gabrielis Landsbergis said that as Russia has shown no regard for civilian lives during this crisis, NATO must prepare and make all necessary means available to defend every inch of Baltic territory. The Foreign Minister Eva Maria Lemetz said Estonia supported a possible enlargement of the EU that would include Ukraine, North Macedonia and Albania in the near future. Let me also remind you that it's not only Germany or the Baltic states deciding on sanctions, it's all 27 member states. This is unanimous decision, and we still are hearing some noise from some capitals that they are going to veto some of our decisions. Let's not forget also this. This is not only what we decide here in Riga or in Berlin or in Vilnius or, or, or in Tallinn. This is also what Rome, what Budapest or what Lisbon decides. It's our common decision. Russia must be isolated politically diplomatically in all international fora, including financial institutions. Within the EU, we have to agree on a new comprehensive package of sanctions as soon as possible, including oil and gas embargo, ban of the remaining Russian and Belarusian banks, as well as broadcasting Russian propaganda channels. The atrocities of Bucha and other cities show that Russians have no regard to civilian lives. So when it is said that every inch of Baltic territory will be defended, there must be all necessary means to defend every inch and every life. When we speak about the EU's enlargement, then of course uh, this is something we are going to discuss later today, but uh, from our perspective, of course, it is important to uh, continue to support the EU's uh, enlargement as a whole, uh, to clearly show that the EU has opened our policy, uh, which uh, so far has uh, uh, proved to be uh, successful, and we also support uh, the um, uh, enlargement uh, via the uh, uh, Western Balkan countries, particularly Macedonia and North Macedonia and, and Albania. Meanwhile, the United States on Wednesday imposed further sanctions on dozens of people and entities, including a Russian commercial bank and a virtual currency mining company, hoping to target Moscow's evasion of existing sanctions over Russia's invasion of uh, Ukraine. The U.S. Treasury Department said it designated a virtual currency mining company for the first time alongside more than 40 people and entities led by U.S. designated Russian oligarch Konstantin Malifaev. Let's take a look at this uh, economic business stories uh, with Laddie Williams, as usual, on the program. Laddie. Good morning. Morning. Yeah. This uh, sanctions now uh, going after companies that have so far evaded sanctions. E exactly. So we're seeing the secondary, you know, sanctions take effect, you know, at this point. And obviously, as the financial sanctions are growing, you know, we're seeing Russia look for, you know, more ways to actually evade these sanctions. So uh, one of them is uh, through, you know, mining 
you know, Bitcoin because Russia has an advantage, you know, once it co- when it comes to mining because they have the, you know, the energy, they have the gas, you know, to mine because it takes a lot, you know, to mine, you know, a new uh, uh, Bitcoin. So the IMF is saying, you know what, uh, we, we believe that Russia is using, you know, cryptocurrencies to actually evade these sanctions. They've not come out straight with the facts yet, but they're saying that, uh, you know, they're signs, you know, and they're saying, you know, most of these uh, crypto companies have to, you know, be more vigilant to make sure that Russia is not using cryptocurrency at this point. The good thing about, you know, the blockchain is you can see most of these transactions, you know, on the ledger. So they're telling, you know, all authorities to be, you know, on, 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 uh, uh, on guard, you know, and watch out, you know, for these kind of transactions, you know, showing maybe Russia moving money, you know, in and out, you know, through the blockchain. So these sanctions are they're quite expected, but, you know, they're, they're going after this uh, mining company. It's one of the biggest mining companies, you know, in Russia at this point. And, uh, they're saying, you know what, let's put our eyes on other companies at the same time to make sure that there's not, uh, they're not using this, you know, Bitcoin, you know, to evade most of these sanctions. The euro, which has been not exactly in the news, uh, at least not in the economic news since all of this began, uh, is now said to have dropped by the largest margin in more than a decade, in fact, since 2011. Exactly. Why is that? Well, we're seeing, uh, you know, with all this uh, geopolitical tension, with, you know, rising inflation, so most uh, investors are running to a, a safe haven asset, which is the U.S. dollar. And that's why we've seen, you know, the U.S. dollar strengthen more. I saw a report from, you know, SWIFT show that, you know, uh, they're using the dollar for more transactions, you know, at this point for, you know, settling, you know, transactions. The euro, you know, has, you know, uh, reduced, you know, at this point, And we're seeing the dollar strengthen more. We also see the yen also, you know, strengthening last month, you know, with transactions, you know, on SWIFT. So it, it just, you know, goes to show that at the end of the day, when there is tension, when there is uh, uh, economic headwinds, investors will run to safer assets. And at this point, the greenback is the safest, asset. you know, asset at this point for, you know, transactions because you don't want to, you know, transact in a currency that could just drop, you know, while, you know, your transaction is going on. So... At this point, we're seeing the greenback actually, you know, gain more strength. And obviously that increases, you know, the cost of borrowing when the dollar actually uh, goes up. So at the end of the day, emerging economies will feel the impact. And that was going to be know. my next question. <laughs> that, you know, of, of the emerging because, who have no role in all of this. Exactly. So it's, it's a far-reaching uh, impact with the currencies. We're seeing emerging economy currencies actually weaken to you know, at this point. So speaking yeah. about the greenback, Russians have withdrawn about almost ten billion dollars of it uh, in March, just March alone. Just March, yes. Why and is that? It, and it started in February. Obviously, when the war started, we saw, you know, most Russians. At the end of the day, there is policy, there's instability, you know, at this point, and you see, you want to keep your assets, you know, safe. So we saw Russians actually, you know, withdraw a huge amount, huge chunks of, you know, foreign currency from. Uh, the Russian banks and, you know, we saw the central bank, the, the Russian central bank actually make moves to... Yeah, to stem, to that, stem that, because that kind of outflow can destabilize, you know, any economy. So at, at this point, that outflow has also entered, you know, into March, because we're still seeing, you know, Russians trying to, you know, pull out as much as they can, you know, from the system, foreign currency. And we've also seen them actually try to use... Uh, you know, Bitcoin. That, too. Which is what I was going to ask you. I said, look, it seems as if all these stories yes. are tied. They're, they're the, tied. The, it's all the, about... The, the issue of evading sanctions using crypto uh, yeah. is a way of getting money out of the country. Exactly. Uh, and evading the sanctions. Exactly. So because... uh, at this point, the amounts being withdrawn, the Russian government doesn't want uh, that they don't money, want that. that kind of money out. Yeah. The... Western allies don't want the Russians to be able to put their money in the Western economies. Exactly. Uh, but... Cryptocurrency is not under anybody's control. It's not really. under, it's decentralized. So at the end of the day, you could just put a, a million dollars into a USB and just 
you know, walk out of the country and go and liquidate, you know, elsewhere. So that's why, you know, the IMF is raising concerns saying this is a financial stability risk, you know, at this point. So they have to, you know, find ways to uh, touch light what's going on, you know, with crypto, make sure that the Russians are not evading these sanctions. And we see the Russian, you know, the Russian government also making sure that the Russians themselves are not able to, are take, not able to take money out of the economy. So it's a, it's a lot of... <laughs> it's, 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 it's a case of between the devil and, and the, the deep blue sea. sea right. Now, the, uh, uh, Germany, which we had in the news saying that it intends to end uh, all imports of uh, oil and gas from uh, Russia by the end of 2022. Uh, we had discussed, you and I had discussed the fact that uh, Germany was particularly vulnerable yeah. to Russian oil and yeah, gas. because they're, they're heavily reliant on... Uh, Russian gas. But, you know, at the same time, we've, we've now seen exports from Germany, you know, to Russia actually drop, you know, in, in March. Yeah, more than, more than 57%. More than, yeah, 50, and, you know, we see Germany exports um, uh, exports to Russia was valued about $32.17 billion. That was in 2021. That's quite huge. And we see Germany exports about, they export machinery, nuclear reactors, boilers, you know, to Russia. They also export vehicles, you know, other than, you know, railway to Russia. But, you know, with this drop now due to, you know, the war, that will impact, you know, Germany's uh, revenue, you know, from these exports because 32, uh, $32 billion, that's a, that's a lot of money, you know, for uh, the exports that actually went to Russia from Germany. So with this drop, it's going to impact revenue. And we also see that Russia need most of these exports, you know, from uh, uh, Germany to, you know, for their production pr uh, processes in um, Russia. So at the end of the day, it's still the sanctions. It's still, you know, trying to squeeze, you know, Russia's <laughs> yeah, economy. Yeah, trying to squeeze, squeeze the life out of it. Out of them at, at this point. So it's, uh, it's, it's a huge sacrifice, you know, for Germany at this point because it's all, also going to impact revenue from the exports to Russia. Can I ask you about oil prices? I, I mean, this is always our red oh, yes. herring, as it were. <laughs> um, I know that you talked yesterday and day before yesterday about supply disruptions. Right. Uh, and, and that had an impact on the stability of the prices. Uh, but it does appear as if the investors or the markets have since calmed down. Is that, yes. is that a correct reading? Yeah, there's, there's been, you know, some kind of calm also with uh, the price of uh, natural gas because we saw huge swings, you know, uh, a couple of days ago because obviously demand for gas is not as high, you know, because the continent is, is quite uh, hot it's at quite, this yeah, point. It's quite so warm. You made, yeah. It's quite warm, so there's not much demand. But at the end of the day, we're still seeing, you know, disruptions, you know, make the, the oil market quite volatile because... We're seeing, um, obviously, Russian oil is uh, heavily sanctioned at this point. But at the end of the day, that Russian oil has to be complemented, you know, from other countries. We saw what happened in Libya mm -hmm. and uh, these other countries. There's a lot of disruption, you know, at this point. And that's, you know, playing into the prices of oil at this point. We're seeing that volatile move still continue. It's up today. It's down tomorrow. But now it's uh, it's marginally up this morning, you know. But obviously, the investors are still weighing, you know, looking at what's happening in Russia and Ukraine to know, you know, their which next way? move. Which way are we selling? Are we buying? Are we longing or shorting? You know, the market at this point. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ladi. As, uh, as usual, there, there'll be a lot to unpack on business uh, morning right after this program, and then on business uh, uh, incorporated later on at 1.30. Ladi Williams, uh, Ini John McQua will be on those shows. Thanks, Thank Ladi. A Russian ultimatum to Ukrainian troops in Mariupol to lay down their arms, as we have already reported, has passed. A Marine commander in Ukraine's last stronghold in the southern city, a steelworks plant, says his men might have only hours left. Ukraine has reached a preliminary agreement with Russia for a humanitarian corridor to evacuate civilians there, but this have failed in the past. Russia invaded Ukraine on February the 24th, calling its action a special military operation to demilitarize Ukraine and eradicate what it calls dangerous nationalists backed by an expansionist NATO military alliance. 
President Putin said as much in a television broadcast at the beginning of the invasion. The People's Republic of Donbass asked Russia for help. I decided to conduct a special military operation. It aims to protect people who have been bullied and subjected to genocide by the Kiev regime for eight years. For that, we will strive to demilitarization and denazification of Ukraine and will bring to justice those who committed multiple bloody crimes against civilians, including Russian citizens. The West and Kiev accused President Vladimir Putin of unprovoked aggression. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg on February the 24th condemned what he called Russia's cold-blooded invasion of Ukraine and announced additional steps to strengthen the alliance's deterrence and defense. This is a deliberate, cold-blooded and long-planned invasion. Despite its litany of lies, denials and disinformation, the Kremlin's intentions are clear for the world to see. Russia's leaders bear full responsibility for their reckless actions and the lives lost. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky on Thursday, February 24th, called on all citizens who were ready to defend the country from Russian forces to come forward, saying Kyiv would issue weapons to everyone who wants them. We're already handing out weapons and we'll hand them out to defend our country, to everyone who wants and has the capacity to defend our sovereignty. The future of Ukraine depends on every citizen. U.S. President Joe Biden hits Russia with a wave of sanctions from February, measures that impede Russia's ability to do business in major currencies, along with sanctions against banks and state-owned enterprises. The Russian military has begun a brutal assault on the people of Ukraine. Without provocation, <clears throat> without justification, without necessity, this is a premeditated attack. On February 27th, Russian President Vladimir Putin ordered his military command to put Russia's deterrence forces, a reference to units which include nuclear arms, on high alert, citing aggressive statements by NATO leaders and economic sanctions against Moscow. As Russian forces advanced towards Kyiv, they accounted fighting by Ukrainian forces in the town of Bucha. On February 28th, a bridge was blown up near the town and it was unclear whether it had been bombed by Russian troops or destroyed by the Ukrainian side. March the 1st, Russian missile attacks hit the center of Ukraine's second largest city, including a residential area and the regional administration building. The deadly attacks on the city killed at least 10 people and injured 35. A few days later, NATO rejected Ukrainian calls to help it protect its skies from Russian missiles and warplanes, but Europe promised more sanctions to punish Russian President Vladimir Putin. Uh, the only way to actually implement something like a no-fly zone uh, is to send NATO planes into Ukrainian airspace and to shoot down Russian planes, and that uh, could lead to a full-fledged war. Um, in, uh, in Europe, President Biden has been clear that we uh, are not going to get into a war with Russia. The next day, Pope Francis said the Ukraine conflict is not a military operation, but a war. In Ukraine, rivers of blood and tears are flowing in Ukraine. This is not just a military operation, but a war which sows death, destruction and misery. NATO warned Russia its war must not escalate beyond Ukraine. And March the 9th, a children's hospital in the besieged port of Mariupol was bombed. The United Nations Secretary General on March the 14th sounded the alarm over Russia, raising the alert level for its nuclear forces after invading Ukraine describing it a bone-chilling development. Further escalation of the war, whether by accident or design, 
threatens all of humanity. Raising the alert of Russian nuclear forces is a bone-chilling development. The prospect of nuclear conflict, once unthinkable, is now back within the realm of possibility. In the middle of March, the U.S. and Chinese president spoke on a video call about Russia's invasion of Ukraine, warning China against helping Russia. All of this is not without the Russian, Ukrainian and other delegates negotiating to end the invasion. Since the invasion, President Zelensky has received the Polish Deputy Prime Minister and Prime Ministers of the Czech Republic and Slovenia, EU Commission President, among other leaders, in a show of high-level backing for the Ukrainian President. Two months since the start of the war, about five million Ukrainians have fled their homes, and even though the fight is now in the east, it isn't without cities which have been shattered and the deaths in their thousands. And the International Boxing Association has claimed it is following up on concerns about the Boxing Federation of Russia, which is facing accusations of bringing the sport into disrepute over its public support of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. In a letter signed by the heads of several national federations, uh, called on the IBA, led by Russian Umar Kremlev, the former Secretary General of the BFR, to take actions against the organization. Addressed to the IBS Board of Directors, the letter seeks to bring to attention uh, social media posts by the BFR about the Ukraine war that nine NF leaders believe potentially violates the worldwide governing body's constitution. The Netherlands' Boris van der Vest, a former IBA presidential candidate, is among the NF presidents to sign the letter, along with Tyson Lee, chair of the Board of Directors at USA Boxing. And just before we go, Irish man Barry Hoyan and his Spanish wife Lola saw Ukrainians fleeing uh, their homes uh, uh, but had no space to help uh, in their house in Madrid. So they decided to offer up their second home instead, a 15th century castle in the west of Ireland. Within a day, Hoyan was on a plane to Poland, having set up a Facebook account for the first time to offer a refuge. Uh, 11 Ukrainians, one group from Dipro and another from Zaporizhzhia near Maripol, returned with him to stay with his family at Balindoli Castle. Maria Zakslova is one of the refugees staying at the family castle. The group are among 23,000 who have so far arrived in Ireland. So it's at that point that we end it. Uh, a note of goodwill gesture. Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, there'll be an update uh, of Russian invasion at five o'clock, so do watch out for that. I'm Ladi Akiri Dulwali. A pleasant Thursday ahead.